Well, hey friends, thank you so much for stopping by our channel today. What you're about to listen to is the most recent sermon preached and recorded live during a weekend service here at Chapel Springs Church. I invite you to subscribe to this channel right now. Head on over to our website, chapelsprings.org for more information and also check us out on social media. Thanks for being here. I'll catch you next time. You know, I grew up in a church where we had a prayer team come up front and every Sunday we gave the opportunity to come forward and to come to Jesus and to share our burdens with one another and to be prayed over and to pray for one another. And I wanna just encourage you, I know that that can sound scary sometimes, especially in a room this size. But when we open that opportunity, I wanna encourage you to do it. There's something powerful about physically moving and coming. Remember our text from this past week where Jesus says, come to me. Those of you who are weary, those of you who are weighed down and burdened, come to me. And the truth is, we would probably all be down here. <laughs> but I pray that God meets you right where you're at. And I want to encourage you throughout this message, at the end of the service, throughout this next week, find a space to come to him, to release what it is that he's asking you to release to him. Amen. We'll go ahead and have a seat. It's wonderful to see you here this morning. We are in a two-week series on what it is to slow down, to go three mile an hour with Jesus to slow down, to take his speed, to take his pace. And let me read this text that Pastor unpacked for us last week. Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 through 30. This is what Jesus says. Come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you because I am humble and gentle at heart and you will find rest for your souls for my soul is easy to bear and the burden I give you is light. Amen. Amen. Lord, have your way in us through the, the teaching of the word this morning. Well, we are looking at going the pace of Jesus, going three miles per hour, and um, the level of technology that we have today allows us to go much faster than that, right? In fact, I am going to be a living illustration for you today. This is my tendonitis. <laughs> I've been working hard and furious to get papers graded <laughs> on the computer, been on my phone a lot the last couple weeks, and I'm paying the price of it. And I may have tried a little bit of golf this week, which I shouldn't have because now I'm back in, it wasn't called golf what I was doing, but <laughs> <laughs> top golf, yes. Um, so last week, Pastor, I wanna encourage you to go back, listen to that message. Um, I'm gonna take a really practical approach to some things he shared with us. Um, last week, but he used the word busy, and it just really got me thinking because we hear that word a lot, and when you look at the life of Jesus in the Gospels, he was on the move. I would call him busy. There, there were things to do, and you see him going from one thing to another to another. He was teaching, he was preaching, he was healing, delivering, all of that, um, but in our culture, I've noticed busy tends to have a very negative association with it today. Um, you guys notice that, that it's like, it's all bad to be busy. So I got to thinking about the word busy, just looked it up, what is our current um, um, 
dictionaries say about it. And Merriam-Webster says that busy is defined as occupied. Well, then that got me down another rabbit trail because the word occupy, you don't hear it a whole lot. But Jesus said to his disciples before he left to occupy, right? He said, occupy until I come. I'm going to return, but until then, occupy. So what was he talking about? Was he just talking about being crazy busy in the, in the negative sense? Um, no, because the word occupy there pertains, a, it's a sense of... Um, of purposefulness and it wasn't just any anything random that you're doing and because Jesus wants us to stay occupied he wants us to be purposefully busy he doesn't want us to be lazy or bored or just hanging out waiting for his return and the dictionary goes on to say that busy is full of activity and I think most of us would probably say that our lives are full of activity right um, it also gives a negative definition, foolishly active. And I think that's the definition we tend to use a lot more when we're talking about busy. Because um, I, I get a lot of people d saying to me, and I hear it in other um, conversations as well, of, uh, well, can you meet with me? And it's like, no, you know, I'm, I'm, my schedule's full. Oh, you're too busy. I get it, you're, you're busy, you're busy. And it's almost like you're wrong for having activity in your life. And I love what Peter Scazzaro, who is a pastor and author, um, what he has written in some of his books, and I ran across this a couple years ago, that really helped me. He says he's learned to respond when people say that. He says, I'm not busy, I'm limited. I'm not busy, I'm limited. And then Barbara Peacock, she uses the word purposeful. She's an author, and she asks herself, okay, am I busy, am I foolishly active, or am I purposeful? And so this, is, this has really helped me to think through this whole concept of, you know, busyness. But I want you to consider our culture and what does it encourage us? How does it encourage to, to be constantly, foolishly active? Think about the culture at large. And then how do you see it encouraging us to be restful? And then think about even within your own family. What, what's your family culture? Because your family has a culture. You may not have intentionally created it, but it's been created. Is it one of foolish activity, constant going and coming? Or is it more purposeful? Is it restful as well? And then, <laughs> let's talk about our workplaces. <laughs> what kind of environment is that? What kind of culture has been created in busyness or also restfulness? And, you know, I, I was sitting here thinking last week, some people are like, yeah, you know what, Pastor Scott, you've never met my boss. And, you know, Stephanie gets the answer to him, and he's all about three miles an hour. But let me tell you something. If I kept putting off a deadline, he would say to me, speed it up, girl. Okay, he, he would say, I need you to go a little bit faster. Okay, so he's... He's not unrealistic. There's things that we need to get done, and that's good. Like, God created us to be purposeful and to do things. So I have a love for technology and the history of technology with culture and um, in the church. And many years ago, I dived into some interesting research on clocks. And the first mechanical clock was created by Benedictine monks to help them live out their rhythm of work, prayer, and rest. And so they used the clock to order their lives around Christ. Um, and, and so when the, the clock would um, toll, when the, when the bell would go off, it would encourage them to go to pray. It was time for them to stop what they were doing, to stop their work, and to go pray. And what's amazing about this is that over time, towns became, um, well, towns would build up around these monasteries because they were using the clock towers and building their rhythms of work around that with the monastery at the center. 
And so if you ever go and stay in a Benedictine monastery, you're going to hear the bells go off um, throughout the 24 hours. There's set times to call them to prayer. And I have done that before, and it does go off like at 3 a.m. I did it once. I was the one person in my group who only did it once and didn't come back the next day. I slept at 3 a.m. But it is a neat experience if you ever get to go do that. Um, So I want you to really think about this because this is fascinating to me. That humans started off using mechanical time to form their lives around Christ. But the opposite has now happened. We began to be formed in the image of mechanical time. So our lives have become calculated, precise, and predictable. And let's be honest, we love it. Because it makes, it allows us to have a sense of control in a world that we can't control. But the 21st century technology is especially created with speed in mind. And much of the technology we create, it goes faster and faster to help us create more, to, to buy more, to consume more, to produce more. And now we value in people what we value in technology, speed. I don't know the last time you've gone through an interview, but a typical interview question is, can you multitask? How good are you at multitasking? And we know the science shows as humans, we really shouldn't be doing it. We're not really that good at it. But you lie and you pretend like you can do it really well. But we value speed in one another the faster we can do things. And so it's our technology, but it's also a value now in people that we have. I want us to go to Mark chapter one. I wanted to take a text here that is a very precious um, passage to me. I love this text in Mark one. I go to it Um, regularly to remind myself of some pretty big lessons that I should keep before me in life. And remember how Christ said, come to me. He he said, I'm going to yoke, get yoked to me, and I'm going to teach you. My yoke is going to teach you. And so how did this play out in the lives of the disciples as they walked with Jesus, as they rested with Jesus, as they ate with Jesus? How did they learn from him? What was it like to be yoked to him every day? So I want to take this text, starting in verse 35, just to unpack what it really means to be taught the yoke of Jesus in a very practical way. So Jesus had a busy day. He was in a synagogue. He was teaching. He did some healing. Then he hears that Simon's mother-in-law was ill. And so he goes to her house, and he prays for her, and she's healed. And then all these other people from town, in fact, the scripture says the entire town showed up wanting healing, wanting deliverance. So they went late into the night, healing and delivering. And then here's what the scripture says in verse 35. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Simon and his companions went to look for him, and when they found him, they exclaimed, Everyone is looking for you! Jesus replied, Let us go somewhere else, to the nearby village, so I can preach there also. That is why I have come. So he traveled throughout Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and driving out demons. Lord, teach us your word this morning. Amen. You know, Pastor made the, the joke last week, which wasn't a joke because it hit close to all of our hearts probably, <laughs> that we, we tend to want to follow Jesus and learn from him in the way of delivery of people who are, you know, are experiencing demonic possession and seeing people healed. We love to be around that stuff. But how many of us are following him getting up early in the morning? And this is a text that really shows the reality of that. 
But what we see here is Jesus is teaching them, even just by them being close to him and them noticing he disappears early in the morning and they go find him. They're learning his yoke. And Jesus's yoke teaches us to prioritize time alone with the Father. No matter what Jesus was doing, how busy he got, how late he stayed up, he was always going to see his Father, to spend time alone with his Father. He went to the solitary place. Your version of the Bible may also say the lonely place, the deserted place. He made sure to prioritize that. So um, over the last few weeks, Pastor, um, I'm not going to talk about you the whole time. I keep referencing you. <laughs> but he made the comment a few times that he, he gets up at 4 a.m. And he, it's just a gift from God. He just wakes up at 4 a.m. now. And he's ready to go. And I don't know about you, but I can't identify with that. I don't get up at 4 and ready to go. I don't walk around at 4 a.m. snapping my fingers. It's not going to happen, and I'm okay with that. So I'm not a morning person. But you know what? I actually think it's a gift. Because for me, it makes me less resistant in the morning. I'm, I have found I'm more open to God because I'm, if I had that energy, I'd be off doing my thing. But being a slow waker-upper, <laughs> like I, I, I just can't quite get there and get my agenda going as fast. And so what I've learned to do over the years, I've learned to lean into this. Um, a couple years ago, I bought a, a clock. I wanted to stop using my phone as my alarm. And so I went and bought an alarm clock, and it's called the Hatch. And it has a dome light on it. And so it, it does have an alarm on it, and it goes off at 6. But I set it to where at, at 5 a.m. the light starts to come on. And it slowly over the hour gets brighter and brighter. And that has really helped me learn to wake up really easily. And so probably around 5.15, um, I start to like wake up a little bit. And what I do is I'm just like, God, I'm here. What's on your heart this morning? And so for about 45 minutes, I don't have anything planned. I don't go grab a devotional. I don't, you know, grab a reading plan. I just lay there and I, I'm just, God, I want to hear your voice. And sometimes I'm in and out of sleep. And what I have found is God will just drop people in my heart. And it, people I would never wake up praying for. And I had this happen two days ago. I somewhat fell asleep again, and then in my dream, I all of a sudden saw this young woman I went to seminary with, and she was a student of mine a couple years ago, and she's been really ill because of COVID the last few years, and I woke up and realized, I think she texted me. Was that a dream? I said, no, and then I get up and I go get my phone. It's 5.30 in the morning. I get my phone. She had texted me one week ago and I hadn't responded because I, I got it in the middle of the day and I was busy, was doing things, and it just completely went out of my mind. And so here is God saying, you need to reach back out to her. You need to talk to her. And so we've got a plan here tomorrow morning to connect um, and so those are the type of things that can happen um, is, is as you're just slowly going, um, learning to get up. So for those of you who are slow waker uppers, it's okay. Okay. <laughs> the other thing, um, I want to talk for just a moment here about the fact that 10 years ago, I can't believe it's been 10 years, but I went to Ireland. My roommate and I at that time, we went to Ireland and Scotland. We just took a backpack and went. That's all we had. And we explored different places in Ireland and Scotland that many of them I had read about and I had been researching for my doctoral work. And I just wanted to go walk 
where so much history had happened and just sit there. And so I, we came up on, we did, this wasn't even on our plan, we came up on these old ruins of a monastery. And you'll see here, um, I don't have the details on where this was at, but I remember it was like from the six or seven hundreds. That's how old this place was. And these are the little monk cells. This is where the monks would go and just spend time with the Lord. This was their solitary place. They would each have one. And so, of course, I had to go in one. So there I am. And you'll notice the little spiky, yeah, ceiling. Um, I, it drew blood that day. The monks, the monks were short people. <laughs> but I, when I think of going to the lonely place, I think about this monk cell. And I think about a comment that um, in one of his books, Henry Nouwen talks about the fact that we can have a portable cell with God. And so we get up, we go to this place in the morning, but when we're in a, an intense boardroom, when you're in your living room and you've got a three and five-year-old screaming and throwing toys at one another, you can picture yourself in your portable cell and go to that place with God and function from a place of rest and wholeness in him. So I just, I love this picture. Um, the other thing I want you to think about because I know some of you are like, you know, I don't remotely relate to monk cells and sitting alone and quietness and all of that. But that's okay because we all connect to God differently. And Gary Thomas wrote a book called Sacred Pathways many years ago. I did a class on this about six years ago with my friend Pete Homan. And I know some of you were in that where for a few weeks we taught different pathways to God and how we are all designed to connect with him in different ways. And we just explored those. And so for some people, you're like, I don't wanna sit in a completely white room alone, complete silence that would drive you crazy, but you really connect to God outside. Well then go to the solitary place outside and walk, go for a hike, go hunting, just get outside. For some people, you need um, candles, you need color around you to, because there's something that just comes alive and connects you to the beauty of God through that. That's all wonderful. And some, some people are more traditional and they love formal written prayers. That's also part of my morning routine. Um, these are just various ways. So if you're someone that comes in on a Sunday and you're looking at some people just really getting into worship, <laughs> you're like, why can't I feel that way? Well, where do you connect with God? It doesn't mean, now you should be here because we're called to come together and gather and to worship together, but no, there are various ways you can connect with God. So explore what that looks like for you. So here's the disciples, they're coming to Jesus. He's in prayer with the Father and they say, everyone is looking for you. Everyone, Lord, everyone, they're ready. They're ready for you to come back and to minister to their needs even more. But here's, here's what happens. Jesus doesn't give in to their needs. He says we need to move on. We need to go to the next town. There's work to do there. So imagine what they were thinking. They're probably trying to figure out why would you leave a place of big ministry and success where there's already people and go on to the next town. Why would you do it? Didn't it make sense to them? But Jesus was putting his yoke around them, right? And he's teaching them a different way. And his yoke teaches us that we are not meant to meet everyone's needs. I tried so many ways to soften this and rewrite it because it sounds really bad, especially for those of us who really are compelled to meet everyone's needs, right? But Jesus moved on. He walked away from people who wanted him to stay, who needed him to stay. I have to wonder, did those people that get delivered go out and find more people and bring them back in to do it, to do it even more? 
And Jesus goes on to the next town. He sets limits. He said, I'm done here. The limitless one limited himself in a human body. A human body that needs rest, that needs food, that needs exercise, that needs to play, to have a social life. He limited himself in that body to show us how to do this. Now, don't get me wrong, there are times of intensity, and we see this in Jesus' ministry. Even for me, I have worked the last two Saturdays like full days. But if that becomes the norm, someone should pull me aside. But that's going to happen. We're going to have to lean into intense times where there's a ministry that needs to happen, where there's work that needs to get done, when there's a house to clean, when there's kids to get from one place to another. But we also need to honor our limits. Jesus didn't come to do this whole kingdom thing by himself. He came He walked among us. He showed us the way. He pulled us alongside of him. He empowered us by his spirit. And then he said, go make disciples. It's going to take all of you. Not one of us is supposed to do this alone. And this is where we get in trouble. So many times we function as if it's just all on us. But we're all called to come in together and to walk in the kingdom And not overly depend on one person or another. It takes all of us. And you know what? We'll be even talking about that more in a few weeks in our Holy um, Spirit Gifts series. So Jesus knew he had to go on preaching the gospel. And the gospel was what? The gospel was the kingdom is here now. It's walking among you. Repent and come walk in it with us. He knew he had to go on and preach that message so more people could come and learn his way. Jesus knew the Father, what the Father had sent him to do because he went to the lonely place with him. And his yoke teaches us to let the Father set our agenda. You notice he says in this text that he's going on to the next town because this is why I came. He knew why the father sent him. He knew the agenda for his life. There will always be people with their agenda for you. And some of it is really good. There's no doubt there were, there were people waiting for Jesus who needed him. But Jesus knew, because he had just spent time with the Father, I've got to be about my Father's business, which requires me to move on. And so I can't let these amazing people set my agenda. I've got to let my Father. And I think this was probably difficult for him. And the reason I say that is because throughout the Gospels, we see Jesus... um, being moved with compassion when people would come to him, when crowds would come, he would be moved with compassion and teach them and deliver them and heal them. And so I have to wonder, was that hard that morning? And if so, I have no doubt it was the fact that he had just been with the father to help him keep his agenda straight. Mark 6 Um, Just a few pages over. There's a really fascinating story here that, uh, quite honestly, I don't like it. And so I try to ignore it a lot. (laughs) Because it's an instance where Jesus was with his disciples and they had been out ministering. And in fact, his disciples had been out on a ministry tour and they come back and they're telling Jesus all this amazing stuff that had happened. And Jesus is like, oh man, that's amazing. Okay, let's go away. Let's retreat. Let's have a staff retreat. Let's just go be alone. So they get in the boat and they get to where they're going to a solitary place. And guess what? The crowds had beat them there. Now, I want the story to say Jesus turned the boat around 
and went somewhere else. But it doesn't. Because they had planned a retreat. I love my retreats. But Jesus taught them. He spent time with those people. And then it got late and they were hungry. And the disciples are like, let's send them on because we don't want to feed them. And Jesus said, no, no, we're going to feed them. And then we have one of the miracles of the multiplying of the, the bread and the fish. And he feeds them. And then to make the story even crazier, you think, okay, then they continued on on their retreat. No, they get back in a boat. Jesus goes to pray on his own. The disciples are in a boat and they end up in a storm. What a stressful day. And they were only on their way to retreats. But the text says that Jesus, when he saw them, he was moved with compassion. So what's the difference here? The fact is Jesus from the very beginning, from early in his life, he knew he had to be about his father's business. And he ends up telling his disciples at one point, everything I say, everything I do is because the father told me to do it or told me to say it. So if Jesus moved on in Mark 1, it's because the father told him to. If Jesus in Mark 6 had compassion and spent probably hours ministering to people, it's because the Father told him to. And that's what we've got to learn to discern. We've got to be in the moment and as needs come, we've got to already be in our little monk cell and know, okay, God is with me. I can hear what it is I'm supposed to do. And if you need the strength to say, no, I'm at my limit, I can't, I can't meet that need, he will, he will help you move on. But he will also give you the grace if you need the, the strength to stop and to pour out even more. But it's his agenda. It's not ours. One question I've come to ask myself, I think I shared this when I talked, to, when I talked about discernment a few months ago, um, but one question that was introduced to me a few years ago that I, I go to all the time now, it, is this mine to do? Is this mine to do? And it helps me discern things so many times. And there's a couple times a year I come before God because there's some big things that I've said yes to. And I put it before God and I say, God, is this still mine to do? Because if it's not mine, it's someone else's. And I don't want to take away what God is wanting them to do. So I encourage you, take some time on a regular basis and ask that, is this mine to do? Even if you want it to be yes, God may say no, that, that, time, is, that time is over. It's time to move on. You think about Jesus in the garden, in the cross, and he, he says, is this mine to do? And the father said, yeah. And then God, re Jesus released it, not my will, but it's your will, father. No one else could do what Jesus did. Henry Nowen, in a little book called Out of Solitude, makes a powerful statement. He says, in the lonely place, Jesus finds the courage to follow God's will and not his own, to speak God's words and not his own, to do God's work and not his own. In the lonely place, Stephanie finds the courage to follow God's will and not her own, to speak God's words and not her own, to do God's work and not her own. Just take a moment, read that, put your name in it. Eleven years ago, I was getting ready to enter a really intense season I was working three part-time jobs. 
trying to pay my bills, pay my school bill. And I was also in going into my final year of my doctoral program, and I was going to be researching and writing. And one day, I, I think I was, at a, I was in a meeting with, there were a number of um, female leaders in this meeting, and we were preparing for this national event we were going to be doing a year from then. And afterwards, after the meeting, this woman, Peggy, came up to me. And Peggy, I love Peggy. Peggy is probably 25, 30 years older than me. She'd been a hospital chaplain for decades. And wisdom just oozed out of her. And she invited me to lunch. And so I was excited because, you know, Peggy wants to hang out with me. And so I remember the day came, and I don't know what I had. I was going on with one of my three jobs and trying to do my studies, but I pulled up into the restaurant parking lot. The, the tires were squealing because I was eight minutes late, and I was late a lot at that time, barely getting from one thing to another. And going, you know, I'm profusely apologizing, and um, we have a nice lunch, and she finishes her salmon. She pushes the plate back, and she said, Stephanie, I brought you here because I want you to know I see you and I see you burning out, and you're not gonna be able to carry this intensity too much longer, and you've got a very full year ahead of you. But I'm gonna be here, and I'm gonna walk alongside you, and I'm gonna help you make some hard decisions. We need people like that in our lives. We need each other, because we all get there. We need someone to say, I see you. I see what's going on. And this is not a good pace for you. You've got better things coming, and I don't want you burned out for it. I'm always grateful for Peggy. Let's stand to our feet. I just want us to end here taking a moment to... Just rest in the presence of God and let's have our prayer team back up. If there's anyone here, maybe God's stirring something in you and you just want to meet with someone, have them pray over you. Maybe you're here and you need to know Jesus and you're like, I don't want to go the crazy pace anymore. I want to go the pace of Jesus. He's going to call you to repentance today, to turn from that way and to follow him. And if you do that, you can just come forward and meet with someone up here. They'll pray with you and um, talk you through what that means. But let's, let's open our hearts, Lord. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it challenges us. It corrects us. Lord, I pray for every person here. Meet them right now where they're at as we just rest in your presence and worship you. Lord, may rest just fall down upon people. May tension release in the name of Jesus. Lord, may you supernaturally empower people for the week ahead by your spirit. 